Frequency Podcast Network. Stories that matter, podcasts that resonate. It wasn't fraught. It wasn't challenged. It wasn't stolen by the machines or by the courts. It wasn't even particularly close. The United States had a choice to make. Its citizens chose Donald Trump. Again. And now, whatever you may feel about that man, Canada and the rest of the world have to prepare for what that choice means. What can the results of Tuesday night's U.S. election tell us about the ones looming in Canada's future? What does a President Trump mean for Canada-U.S. relations, whether that's under Prime Minister Justin Trudeau or whomever replaces him? What does a second Trump administration mean for Canada as a whole? For its economy, for its border, its security and defense and place on the global stage. Our current Prime Minister's father famously compared Canada-U.S. relations to sleeping next to an elephant, making us aware of every grunt and twitch. And it seems that... The elephant is about to do a whole lot more than just grunt and twitch in the near future. So what should Canada be doing to prepare? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. David Mosscrop is a political writer and commentator. You can find his work at davidmosscrop.com on Substack. You can also read his book, which is five years old now and gets perhaps more (laughs) correct every day. The book is called Too Dumb for Democracy. Hello, David. Hello, it's great. I don't need to write another one. It holds up. No, you really don't. Maybe a new foreword or something. Yeah, new edition. That's a good idea. Listen, everybody by now has seen uh, what happened in the American election last night, and uh, they can all feel very different ways about it. But I guess what I want to ask you before we get into the impacts on Canada is what can we learn about uh, who voted for whom and by how many? Like, is there anything to take away here? Yeah, I think there there are a few things to take away. And one is is beware of monocausal explanations, which is a good rule for not just this moment, but for every moment, which is whenever you think that there's one way to explain complex phenomenon— it's worth taking a pause and thinking, is that is that really true? You know, can we really simply say, well, you know, Harris lost because X, Y, or Z. She lost because she didn't do Rogan's podcast. She lost because she didn't spend enough time in, in Michigan. She lost because of her position on Palestine. She lost because et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's actually, she lost for lots of different reasons. But there are reasons that stand out. And one seems to be a class realignment and a shift towards Trump from working class folks. There was a big shift. He, he won a lot more votes this time around from people making less than $50,000 a year than last time. Uh, he dominated among uh, people without a college education. And then, of course, familiar patterns. He dominated among men, white men, but he also won white women and Latino men. And so you start to say, okay, so he's put together a coalition of people that is rooted in, among other things, uh, working class folks and the non-college educated who turned out to support him and turned away from the Democrats. Here's one thing I want to ask, especially because you just ran through, you know, all those uh, reasons people say why Kamala Harris lost. And I know both statements are technically true, but did she actually lose this race or did Donald Trump just go out and win it? Well, I've seen some data to suggest that the Republicans didn't run the greatest campaign in history. It's not like they ran a Reagan 1980 campaign. In a lot of ways, the campaign was was a bit of a dumpster fire. And and Trump is, they're still counting votes, so we won't know for a little bit, but he may end up with fewer votes this time than last time. (laughs) Of course, Harris ended up with fewer votes still than Biden had last time. So it's really the battle of of the fewer votes this time around that Trump has edged out. But one area where he really exceeded was in a focus on cultivating and mobilizing people around anti-incumbent, anti-establishment, and uh, economic concerns. 
Because I think at the end of the day, one of the most compelling, not done the single uh, explanation, but one of the most compelling explanations for the win is how people felt about the economy and about inflation and how they feel about, quote unquote, the system. And Trump was able to mobilize people around those concerns. One more question about the election itself. In the days leading up to it, um, when it was pretty much assumed or at least predicted by all the polls that it would be an incredibly tight, incredibly close election, there were a lot of fears about uh, Republicans in particular contesting things, polling places, about potential unrest, potential even violence. Is it at least good for democracy that the election went off the way it did? Well, yes and no. I mean, it, it because people were so concerned about violence uh, because of what happened in 2016, the, the attack on the Capitol and the coup attempt, there was a real worry that this time around we'd see something similar or worse. Of course, we didn't because Trump won. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the counterfactual is what would we have seen if he didn't win? And in the early hours of voting, Trump had taken to Truth Social to complain about fraud in Pennsylvania and elsewhere, and law enforcement is coming, he says. And then later, he just he withdrew the concerns about Pennsylvania because he won the state. So, uh, you know, on the one hand, yes, it's great we didn't see violence, but we didn't see violence because the side that was going to get violent won. If they had lost, we might have. So I ultimately don't think it's a good news story for democracy. It's just the fact is we didn't see it because the people who perpetrated the violence didn't need it. But that doesn't mean they won't need it in the future because we've seen them use it in the past. That's enough about um, the actual American election and what it means for American voters, because anybody who wants to dwell on that has uh, no shortage of podcasts to choose from, uh, from huge American news outlets. But... I want to ask you first about the results of the election, and we'll get to what a a Trump administration could mean for all aspects of Canadian life, but uh, what did the results of this election tell us about uh, Canadian elections possibly to come, uh, whether sooner or later? I think a few things. One is there is now, I think, enough of a pattern of anti-establishment and anti-incumbent sentiment both in Canada and around the world, to say that it's a rough time to be an incumbent party. It was a rough time to be an incumbent party in the United Kingdom when it was the Conservatives. It's proving to be a rough time to be an incumbent in Germany. It was rough uh, in France. It's been rough uh, in, in Canadian elections as well, subnationally, even though you know the BC NDP managed to hang on, but they, they took a, a bit of a beating. It was rough in New Brunswick for the incumbent. It's set to be rough in Quebec for the incumbent. It's a rough time to be an incumbent, which is good news for the conservatives and bad news for the federal uh, liberals. And But the other thing is the economy, how people feel about the economy and inflation are still central issues. And we're absolutely going to see them uh, mirrored in the federal election here as core, core, core focuses, especially from the conservatives. So, you know, that is a lesson that that we could have seen coming well before this vote in in the United States, but this vote certainly confirms it. On Wednesday morning, uh, Justin Trudeau uh, sent a message of congratulations to President Trump, whom obviously uh, he worked with and around, I guess, at times during his (laughs) uh, first term. Um, How do you think Trudeau and the prime minister's office uh, might see this result in their next year or less of governing to come. So there's two there's two ways to think about it. One is the the political side looking forward towards the election, and the other is the governing side trying to manage the state of of the country. Let's do the the country first. It's going to be extremely difficult to manage the Trump administration. Trudeau warned us about this in in January. He said, you know, the first Trump administration was difficult. A second one will be uh, at least as difficult or more difficult. He said something like that. And he's right. Trump is coming for Canada on trade. He's threatening a 10% or even 20% across the board tariff. That, That may apply to Canada or may not. But right now we're in the crosshairs along with everyone else. Defense is going to be a top issue. Uh, specifically spending and reaching the NATO commitment uh, of 2% of GDP, which would require us to double our spending, which is going to be hard to do if we're in a recession because of a 10% tariff. 80% of our trade goes to the United States. 
Then we have migration. Trump is threatening a mass deportation program that would create a migrant crisis in the United States that would also affect Canada. Trump has discussed coming for Canadian water oh. <laughs> to help alleviate Californian droughts and uh, so on down the line. So there's a lot to manage. And as if that weren't that was enough of a problem to begin with, Trump and Trudeau aren't super best friends. Not the warmest relationship. So on the on the governing side, it's going to be extremely difficult. And on the political side, you might think, well, the liberals would love to run against Trump. But polling data from Angus Reid shows us that actually Canadians prefer Polyev deal with Trump. And if the economy takes a downturn because of Trump policies and how close we're bound up with the United States, then the liberals are going to own that. And so I'm not convinced the liberals are in good shape because of the Trump win. I actually think it's going to be a big problem for them. When you look at Trump's proposed policies, and you just mentioned some of them and how he might or uh, might not enact them towards Canada, how do we prepare for, uh, I guess, a more protectionist, inward-looking America? Kind of when when Trump won the first time, I think there was a temptation, not just from Canada, but a, a lot of governments around the world to say like, wow, you know, that was a fluke. Um, America made a huge mistake. We need to weather the storm for four years. And ultimately, that's what happened. But uh, as we mentioned off the top, this was not that close. This is the leader Americans clearly want. How does Canada grace for that fact. I think Canada's best bet is to do what it did last time. Uh, I, I don't think there's a lot of innovation to be had here. Um, you know, the Trudeau government did its best in 2016. And I think an objective, reasonable sort of dispassionate analysis, which is they actually did okay, all things considered. It could have been a lot worse. And the threat is bigger this time, so they're going to have to rely on old strategies even more diligently in the past. But I think those strategies are good. And the focus is to not just work the White House, but to work state houses, to work governors, to work cross state, especially for uh, border states, with key contacts who can then filter up to the White House, especially in states where Trump won, because he did win several border states. And of course, work Capitol Hill, work the Senate, work the House, and work industry, and try to build a coalition outside of the White House that you can then leverage to influence the White House for things like an exemption from the tariff, for instance, or more favorable terms when the USMCA renegotiation comes up in 2026, because that's coming too. And I and, and then that's probably the best strategy they they can adopt while also tiptoeing around, you know, trying to avoid stepping on any random landmines that might ha happen to come up in the process. What about internationally? You know, the other members of NATO also, uh, some of them have leaders that have spoken about, you know, how dangerous a second Trump term would be. None of them, I guess, are making the commitments that he would like to see in terms of defense spending. Uh, can Canada leverage our allies here to sort of stand up a little better as a group, even if we don't have so much power on our own as neighbors? I'm not so sure we can. I look at Trump's past and he's not exactly a multilateral guy. <laughs> right. He's not a big liberal institutionalist. Uh, he's a zero-sum power politics bully. That's how he runs uh, the White House. That's how he's going to run the country. And I think if you're Canada and you say, well, you know, we've spoken to France and we've spoken to the United Kingdom and here's what we think, Trump's going to say, well, a pox on all your houses to hell with all of you. And uh, I spoke with someone, a guy named Graham Thompson from Eurasia Group for something I was writing and I was talking to him about how Canada talks about our deep historic ties with the United States and our special relationship. And his response was basically, Trump doesn't give a damn about any of that. Hmm. And I think the same logic applies to the multilateralism and to the stance of our allies. He views the United States as the hegemon, as the A1, as the top dog. And trying to appeal to him through multilateralism or deep historical ties is just not going to do it. So we're going to have to speak to him in a language he understands, which is going to be the language of transactional politics at the domestic level, which it goes back to the strategy of working the states. When we talk about the impacts of a second Trump term on Canada, I think uh, a lot of people today are doing it in broad strokes like we've been doing, right? Like uh, there's going to be the trade aspect, the immigration aspect, the defense spending aspect. 
When you look at the average Canadian who is the person we're talking about who is dealing with, you know, uh, affordability, a housing crisis, et cetera, et cetera, how might that person feel the impact of a second Trump term in their lives, if at all? It, it depends a lot on what their political allegiances might be, on what uh, their their personal lives might look like. Uh, on what their connections to the United States may be. I think there's a lot of people right now looking at the U.S. worried because they either have friends or family or colleagues there, and they're worried about the state of the country. They're worried about the stability of American democracy. They're worried about the future of, of migration in the country. They're worried about abortion and a woman's right to choose. And that has a serious psychological, personal toll that it takes. Right, And they might be worried about the economy too, or or they ought to be worried about it because if, if we get into a trade war with the United States, if we're dealing with a ten percent or twenty percent tariff from our number one trading partner, number one with the bang, like eighty percent, uh, then we're going to be staring down higher costs, uh, even a recession, and that's obviously going to have direct material impacts on people. And then, of course, there's there's always the concern that things really, really go pear shaped and that American democracy absolutely collapses, which is going to create a crisis that that I don't think we can even really fully wrap our heads around before it happens. So, you know, day to day Canadians ought to be concerned. They have reason to be concerned. And you might say, well, it's a different country. And that's true. But when you're bound up as close as we are, materially, psychologically, and otherwise, it's it's hard to to remove yourself from from the happenings in that country. In the intro, I mentioned the old uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau line of uh, like, you know, sleeping in a bed with an elephant and you're aware of every grunt and twitch, which uh, is famous for a reason because it rings so true when you say how tightly we're bound up together. When you look at all that and you look at the impacts that we've just discussed, you know, we can talk about preparing, but uh, given the respective size and, and power on the world stage and everything about the two countries, how much can Canada realistically do to mitigate whatever the impacts of, uh, you know, Trump's uh, usually sort of haphazard decision making might be? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And it, it really depends on what you're talking about. Is it about saving our own bacon? Is it about protecting, helping protect? To protect the republic itself? Is it about trying to protect the global order, for instance, NATO? I think on foreign affairs, our standing has been greatly diminished over the last few decades. It's unclear what the Canadian foreign policy strategy is. It's unclear what the defense policy strategy is. We're seen as as weak free riders, not just by the United States, by the way, by global partners around the world. So I think on foreign affairs, we are too diminished to really play a significant role in stabilizing things at this point. That's my sense, at least. Domestically, we can try to protect ourselves through the ways we discussed earlier. But I don't think we're going to get away with lecturing the United States on their democracy. So I would say on on balance, we're not going to be able to exert a ton of influence on the United States as the United States or on the United States as part of a global regime. But we might be able to mitigate, to limit the damage domestically. And you might say, well, if you're doing a calculus, maybe that's where we should put our energy. And that may change. If the government changes, we may see a a realignment under a Polyev government. But for at least the next several months, perhaps a year, uh, I think that's what we should expect. I kind of just mentioned um, Trump's haphazard decision making. And, you know, we can talk a lot about policies he promised during his first term that he just kind of ignored or ideas he came up with that then he never pursued. But there, of course, also are ones he did. In the few months before he does take power, what will you be looking for to get a sense of what we can actually expect in terms of the impact on Canada of the issues we've just talked about? Like how much of this is is going to become real. Because Trump, as you mentioned, is so mercurial, it's it's very hard to know. But it's reasonable to look at past as prologue in the last couple of months and say, oh, he does seem to have a few themes he comes, comes back to and actually seems to care about. One of them is tariffs. So we can look and see, does that remain a priority? I think it will. That could be a day one priority. So then we say, okay, well, how do we fight then to make sure we're exempt? 
to trade uh, more broadly, which is to say the, the USMCA. He's already said he wants to renegotiate that. He's done it once. He wants more access to Canadian dairy. He wants more protectionism built in. So effectively, he wants to undermine the trade regime. So we can assume that's going to be on the agenda and prepare for that. And defense spending. Defense spending, is he's going to continue to hammer on that and threaten on that and put pressure on us, on Canada for that. Then we might say, okay, but we don't actually think he'll do the mass deportation thing because it's actually really hard to do and really expensive and it's going to be fought all, all over the place, including the courts. Uh-huh. But nonetheless, even talking about it risks spiking a migration crisis. So that we do have to prepare for that if he continues to talk about that, which I think he will. And so the answer is sort of, well, it looks like everything is potentially on the radar. We can keep watching for signals and seeing what's going to be a priority, but you have to take all of those things seriously and prepare for them because even if they don't come to pass, you'd, you know, you're better to be prepared and not need to be prepared than need to be prepared but not be prepared. Maybe we get away with the water thing because he forgets about it. <laughs> and it's California and he didn't win California, right? But on balance, I don't think we're going to be able to escape on the other issues. Uh, One of the reasons that I'm always happy to talk to you is because uh, you've also done a lot of work on the big picture uh, historical aspects of our current political situation. So the last thing I'll ask you is just like on, you know, the global arc, I guess, of uh, what we're discussing in the way the most powerful nation in the world kind of ebbs and flows. uh, What is your biggest takeaway from uh, what the world has just seen here? I think the core takeaway is that as as complicated as politics uh, can be and seem, as intricate as it can be and seem, at the end of the day, there are common themes that persist throughout history. And one of those is uh, the economy and inflation are such utter central concerns that they do shape history in ways that we can't deny. They're not the only thing, uh, as I mentioned off the top, you know, beware of monocausal explanations. But as someone put it on on the internet, um, you know, inflation is the government killer. It was the economist Isabel uh, Weber. And that's been true for for centuries. And uh, it's true again today. And it's if you're in politics and you're trying to navigate the moment, I think being mindful of that is probably job one. And I think Harris, perhaps in retrospect, although maybe there's not much she could have done, I um, might wish that she'd paid even more attention to that. David, thank you so much for doing this. Um, it is always a pleasure, even uh, when the subject is a little less pleasurable. Pleasure's all mine, such as it is. David Mosscrop. You can find him at David Mosscrop on Substack, or you can purchase Too Dumb for Democracy from your nearest bookstore. That was The Big Story. For more from us, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca To send us any feedback or suggest an episode, you can write to us. The email is hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca and the phone number to call to leave a voicemail is 416-935-5935. Unless something crazy happens, which, let's be honest, it very well might, this will hopefully be our last episode on the U.S. election for a while. We like doing Canadian stories better anyway. I hope you like listening to them. The Big Story is available in every single podcast player and, of course, on your smart speaker. Ask it to play The Big Story podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.